A teaching from God's Word, entitled, Charity, Doing Well. Out of the third epistle of John, verse 6, it reads, Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. In God's Word here, we could see the context of the word charity, speaking of the love of God in a special manner. And they're not asking anything. In verse 7 it says, Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We see a little bit of an interpretation of how the word charity is being used. They're giving the love of God expecting nothing in return. There's no greater witness of that than of the life of Christ. In the second epistle of John, in the ninth verse, it says, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. So important. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ he is both the Father and the Son. Amazing how this statement encapsulates everything we learn. Without the doctrine of Christ, we're in useless territory. We could study anything, and it's useless because we are not of God without the doctrine of Christ. And the doctrine of Christ is clear in John's eyes. Christ has become flesh and dwelt among men, the scripture says. The doctrine of Christ is spoken of in verse 7. He who confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is a deceiver. The teaching that Jesus Christ became flesh becomes paramount to all doctrine. We could fellowship with people who, who think that Christ is coming in 100 years from now or next week. We could fellowship with people that baptize in different manners. We could fellowship with people that have different opinions on different things, but we have no fellowship in Christ with someone who does not believe that God has become flesh that Emmanuel is with us. This is the doctrine that we fellowship with. Once we realize that God has become flesh, the whole scriptures take a clearer meaning and the revelation begins within us. We can see what happened in the Gospels. We are were, we were told to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And without the true gospel, what is the preaching? Where does it go? What does it do? Christ was born of a virgin in a manger. The story begins. The good news begins. Christ now has become flesh and dwelled with us and with the body of Christ. And even though he's not in the earth right now, he is in the body of Christ right now. His flesh is in the body of Christ. It's shared with us in his supper. It's shared with us in the heavens as he is king of kings and lord of lords. As he has been crowned by his father. He returned to the heavens with the blood. Let's talk about what happened with this testimony of Christ became flesh. The father manifests the sun and the earth, 
The Son carries the blood, the blood, the perfect blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. We see a resounding of the verse in 3 John that this charity is given without anything in return. Who can pay for the blood of Jesus? No one. Who can pay? Who can compare with this power? Who can buy your salvation? Who can buy the price that it costs for your eternal life? No one but Christ. It can never be replaced. It's the life of Christ. This shed blood of Jesus is the ultimate charity. This shed blood of Jesus that came from Calvary's cross multiplying itself within us. The power of God multiplying itself in the creation. The Creator's power coming into us. And the body of Christ does not have all the power of God right now. All the power of God came through Christ's body when He shed His blood on the cross and He bled out. When He bled His last drop, when that blood conquered death, it resurrected and burst into the creation. The eternal light now burst into the creation. In Resurrection Sunday morning, Christ got up from the grave. The first fruits to the Father. And Christ being the first fruit is now telling the apostles and the women who loved Him, who now would be fruits also, of the power of this blood and what it did. When we say we're saved by the blood, do we fully realize the power that's in this blood? It's We say we plead the blood. This isn't a pleading. The, the blood has already been brought before the Father. The pleading of the blood has been brought before the Father. The shed blood of Jesus is the voice before the Father. It's the speaking of the Father for us. It shuts up the voice of all evil. No longer can evil dominate what Christ saves and where His blood touches. It's the blood covenant. It's the blood promise of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. This blood spoke to the Father on the throne. This blood speaks to our life. Right now it speaks to our lives, telling us, you're redeemed, rise up, follow me. You're ransomed, the price has been paid. The pleading has taken place and now the, shed, the shedding has caused the resurrection and that resurrection is in you and it's spreading through this creation. Oh, hallelujah, the power of God's blood, the earnest of our salvation comes the witness to us. That earnest is the Holy Spirit of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that comes through the blood. Let's take a look at God's Word. No wonder He tells us to fret not and pray because in prayer, this is where Christ started His passion, in prayer in the garden. And He's saying to us, I've been failed in prayer, pray. That blood starts shedding in that garden when he bled droplets of blood. The blood speaking to the Father, and it wants to speak to the Father in us. The Lord said, I stand at the door and knock. If any will enter me, with me, I will sup with him. The prayer of faith is causing the faithfulness in you to rise up to the Father and speak to the Father. Prayer is manifesting the will of God in the earth when we bear witness to prayer. When we're saying to God, we, we believe, we accept. This blood is the most powerful vo force in the universe. The most powerful voice is the voice of Jesus and His voice is in His blood. When He speaks through you, it's because of the blood. When His power comes through you, it's because of the blood. It's the shedding of blood that's reconciling this universe. And that blood's only shed once. But it's growing in us. Its power is growing in us. 
It's fulfilled already. The Father has said yes. The power is perfect in the blood. It can never be broken. How much can we receive of it? How much can we bear witness? We bearing witness to God's blood. We bearing witness to that redemption. Causes the voice of the Holy Spirit to resound around us. And cause the creation to subject itself to God. God is rising up within his people. In Colossians 3.14 3, it says, And above all things embrace love, which is the bond of perfection. Perfect love is, was in that blood. The giving of a gift that can never be paid for. The whole creation cannot pay for what Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary. All the praises for all eternity cannot pay that price. All the gifts, all the worship, all the self-denial, all the obedience to all laws cannot pay for that blood. The scripture says in Colossians 5, 2, walk in love. Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and as a sacrifice to God. You're the light of the world because Christ light is in his blood. It's the severing of self that Christ did on the cross. The perfect giving. And we touch it when we get saved. And we find it when we study, accept, and fellowship with him. It is him. God has been made flesh and dwelt among men. He says, he, in Titus 2.14, he gave himself for us that he would redeem us. And the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he said, would come in Titus 2.13. Praising God for this holy revelation in his word. There's no power like it. We could talk about science and physics and all the things of nature, but we can't, we can't touch this kind of power. It can't not be touched. If energy is mass times the speed of light squared, then eternity is the substance of things hoped for by the light of Christ revealed in the four Gospels. Because it's revealed in the Gospels, we've learned the cross. In the cross, there's the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of Christ. Squared. Light is squared in the cross of Christ. God took his light and made it eternal to save us on that cross. Sent that eternity on that cross to find us. And he needed to send it in the four dimensions because that's where his people were lost in time. In the height and depth and length of life. The scripture calls it the four corners of the altar. No wonder the sacrifice was on four corners. And the lamb was tied to four corners. Because that blood would roll over those four corners. And that blood would speak in heaven for us. To the uttermost. My people are saved. This love is so tremendous. No matter what you're going through in your life, both your worries of yesterday and what you're going through today and your fretting of what tomorrow may be, don't compare any of that to the blood of Jesus. The love is so pure and so perfect from God. The kindness so good. The giving so perfect. The term charity was used in the scriptures describing this kind of love that cannot be replaced or described or Understood completely. It's above understanding. The love of God. The peace of God. Is in that love.
The peace of God the Father is in that love. The love of Jesus being poured out and the comfort of the Holy Spirit is in that love. You can have that comfort today. This sermon is being preached, but the blood is speaking to you in your hurts, in your problems, and in your weaknesses. You can have that comfort today that comes from that blood. That blood speaking to the Father for you today. He doesn't have to be ever be crucified again or wounded again for you. His wound is so huge, so great, and so powerful, it envelops you and enveloped you before you were born. And that love is reaching out to you right now and wants to comfort you and heal you. If you're suffering a loss, a family member, a health problem that causes pain, emotional problems that can be worse than all those, God's love is reaching you today. It's reaching out to you. Let God know that you want to receive that love. Ask him to open up your eyes to how much he loves you. The much he wants you near him. He created you to be near him, not far from him. This love has penetrated the darkness between you and him to bring you near to him. Near to his heart. Near to the thoughts of his heart. His thoughts for you. When he formed your face, when he formed your heart, he formed it because he wanted to love that face and that heart. You feel a need in him, and that need is you. And that shed blood came looking after you, seeking you to find you. Life's voice is in that blood. And that voice is speaking life. He doesn't want you weak and tired and lost. He wants you filled with life. And you'll get there. I don't know the timing of God for every healing. I don't know the timing of every salvation. And neither do other preachers. No matter how much some of them say they do. Everything's now to some of them. But unfortunately now goes through time. Now was yesterday, now is today, and now will be tomorrow. God knows your now, and he knows when it will be. He knows your healing. He knows when it will be. He knows the day you'll depart from this earth, and no one will stop it. He will determine that day. But that love is now, yesterday, today, and forever. That voice of love and life is here today and you could taste it and you could drink it. If you feel guilty about the things you did, wash your, wash your flesh in the waters of Christ. The Holy Spirit said he would wash you, cleanse you in his blood and there's water of refreshing in him and he will wash your body clean in his presence. Seek his presence and find it. When Christ was born in this earth, he was wrapped in humility. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so did the word of God come to us, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And the geniuses and the elite of this world look down on it. They see swaddling clothes. Can you see wrapped in the swaddling clothes? The power of that charity. Christ as an infant carried that blood. Carried the Father's will to this earth and he carried it for you and me because he loves us. And he will not forsake us and he will not leave us. We preach born again to people and sometimes they don't understand what it means. They don't know what born again has to do with their soul. They don't realize that the essence of God becoming flesh can happen in you he will become flesh in you when you're born again. And your destiny has changed. And the beautiful thing about the rebirth experience is your name is written in the book of life. You know, some say, you read places in the Bible where they had their names blotted out of the book of life. That's not the born again. 
In the book of Revelation, there are those whose names will not be blotted out of the book of life. That's the born again. Do you want a relationship with God? Born in this blood? Those that value this sacrifice, that value this love in Christ, that, give their, that value it and give their heart to it, they become born again. They are the born again. Say, somebody might say to you, well, what is the difference between you and another religious person? Well, I don't know what they're all about, but I know my name's written in the book of life. I know it cannot be blotted out. I know Christ wrote it and no one will change his mind and he doesn't make mistakes. The reborn believer saved by the one who is wrapped in swaddling clothes. The prophet called this miracle a bundle of life. I have received a bundle of life. Christ moving in my soul, living in me. When you wake up in the morning, you could say, what is the, what do I feel today, Father? I feel love for you and I feel your love for me. Your love for me is moving in a bundle of life bundle of life. There's no power in the universe stronger than that blood. This word of God shed itself to me. Shed abroad. And the love of God now is in me that cannot be overcome. The love of heaven that was not overcome on Calvary's cross is now in me. There is those that say, we'll preach the cross. And actually they're mentioning the cross. Because the preaching of the cross is done not only with words, but deeds. The apostle James said, what good is your faith without works? Your works justify you. Your faith brings you to Christ, but by your works, your faith is established and rooted in your life. Faith without works is dead because we are justified by works of faith. So it says in the book of James. And hallelujah for that. Christ did not talk about being a sacrifice. He became a sacrifice. And we are to give him the sacrifice of praise. Every good moment in our life has him in it. A new taste, a new smell. The person who takes a, a herb thinking to bring health to himself and smells the beauty of it or tastes the beauty of it. Oh, the taste of curcumin. Oh, the taste of mint. Oh, the taste that Christ made. The smell of flowers telling us that the richness of life is in this earth. He put it there. And if it became flesh and dwells in this earth, if he created this creation, how much greater will this creation become when God who becomes flesh blesses it? We have yet to see the fullness of the New Testament blessing on this earth by Jesus Christ. He's coming to do it. And he's coming quickly. He's coming soon. You hear people say, well, they always believed that. Well, they were supposed to. Because they were to warn the ones that were going to be here then that that's what you're supposed to do. Watch and wait for it to happen. Just as somebody cuts a tree down and hits it with an axe over and over again. You might say, well, did you cut the tree down? No, I hit it. It didn't come down. Did you hit it? I hit it again. I hit it again. I hit it again. But there will be one blow of the axe that will bring the tree down. And the believers have been believing since Christ ascended. He's coming back. He's coming back 
Peter preached it. Paul preached it. The disciples preached it. Throughout the ages, Christians have read it and taught it. It's resurging again, mightily. And the axe is to the tree. And the tree called the natural world is coming down. To yield itself to the kingdom of God. How is this kingdom affecting us? If you're believing that that tree is ready to come down. Called the kingdoms of this world. If you're believing this word. You're not going to stand in the way of it coming down. And you're not going to die. Who, if, seeing a tree that's teeter-tottering in the wind, would you stand under it? Why are people standing under the tree that's ready to come down? Oh, maybe it'll be a hundred years. We could have a picnic here under this tree. It'll be decades from now. We could fish under this tree. Oh, praise God for those that are wise that come away from the world, that separate themselves from the world, that separate themselves from the ways of the world. The tree's coming down, and I'm not part of it. Christ is coming back. He's telling us that this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes is going to return. And garments of praise will be wrapped on him by the saints. The beauty of heaven. The glories of the Father. Wrapped on him. The beautiful mind of Christ sharing with us. We won't have to worry about having false teachings when Christ returns. He's the teacher. He's the prophet. He's the instructor. He's the great apostle and high priest of our profession. And all teachers will be directly taught by him. And they will share. They will be sent and they will share with his creation. But we won't have to worry about those that don't know who he is. The Bible says everyone will know who he is. The question is, do you know who he is? Do you feel the urgency of loving God? Why wait until there's no way out of a problem? If you have Christ invested in you, invested in your inner soul, invested in your inner parts, what happens to you is when crisis comes, the investment is already there and paid for. Why would you seek to make Investments to pay for a problem that's upon you. When that investment could be made. Word of God's clear. Don't store up treasures that are in heaven. Or that are on earth. But treasures that are in heaven. That are unto everlasting life. These are the treasures that you store up. Treasures in Christ. The treasury of charity. Faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is love. Charity of God. The greatest is love because it cannot fail. It cannot forget us. It cannot abandon us. Christ will never abandon somebody on the battlefield of good and evil. Christ will never abandon anybody in the battlefield of sickness. Christ will never abandon the brokenhearted. He will never abandon the stranger. He is a place for every soul. Our earth has such an upheaval in it that people don't know where to live. They're wondering. They're being exploited. They're trying to find a place to feed their children. They're trying to find a place of safety from evil. And sometimes we need to just 
wait on God and say, God, where would you have me? How will you feed me? How will you feed my children? I know you could do it. How will you cause me to rest in you? How will you give me life? And that more abundantly. In the book of Proverbs, it says in chapter 2, verse 10, when wisdom entered into my heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. When wisdom enters into thy heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. The entering of God's knowledge, the entering of his word, the entering of his salvation is pleasant. It's pleasant to you and it's pleasant to God. The word of God says, he lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He'll fight for you if you walk uprightly. He'll give you pleasant things to know if you're seeking his wisdom. And Paul says wisdom's in the cross and we taught, oh, this unfathomable knowledge of the cross, we touched it today. This knowledge of the preciousness of the blood of Jesus and its power. There's nothing that can resist it. And the knowledge of the cross is pleasant to the soul. How could a bloodbath be present to the soul? It was a bloodbath. Jesus was drenched in his own blood. He suffered for every army. He suffered for all mankind. When we read the history of people in the earth and the millions that were killed in battle and savagely destroyed by violence. Here Christ identifies with his creation. This is God becoming flesh and not ignoring the bad part and running to the pleasant part. He runs to the bad part to solve it first. He's bathed in the blood. Bathed in his own blood to save our blood. And then he rises up in a pleasant state and says to us, I desire that you rise with me. Is your heart longing to be with Christ? To share your thoughts with him? To hear him breathe? When you love somebody, the smallest things that they do interest you. I remember when I was a small boy, my grandfather he was an Italian-American and had grapevines. He would dip his bread in some olive oil. and He would crunch the celery in his mouth and he would chew it. And I can remember being intrigued by how much he was enjoying his garden. He would take a whole onion and dip it in olive oil and just crunch it. And as a young boy, I'm saying, oh my goodness, that onion's strong. But his eyes would brighten up as the vegetables and fruits of his garden would strengthen him. Those little things I remember, do we know God that well? There are those that know the sigh. The Bible the Bible says that 
When Jesus went to Lazarus to the tomb, he sighed. Oh, those that were standing there to hear Jesus sigh. And then he wept. You might say, that's a hard experience, but you'd never forget it because you love Jesus. You've seen him cry, you heard him sigh. He wants to get near you that way. So you would know what he likes and what he don't like. What he does. What he feels. He wants to be in you and know you. He wants to write your name in the book of life. Do you want to be that close to Jesus? The Bible says if you accept him as your Lord. And when he becomes your Lord, he writes it down. It's so important to him. You know, just say, okay, and walk away. It's important to him. It's a document to him. He makes a great contract, covenant. They accepted me. I love them. I'm going to make great promises to them. Promises that they can't make me. But I'll make those promises to them. I'll write your name in the book of life. Will you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Do you want to know Him? He's God in the flesh. He died on the cross. He purged your sins. And He rose from the dead and you'll rise with Him. If you ask Him to forgive you, if you ask Him to enter into your heart, Heart and make it his house. And lastly, accept his promise that you will rise up with him. Believing in that resurrection power that the blood purchased, you will live with him forever. Do you feel his presence? He's a living God, a bundle of life. If you truly believe, you will walk and stand and howl 